Uh, you heard about time modeling from other presenters, and uh, in the next uh, 40 minutes, I will be talking about heads up and how these models were actually developed, and try to give you some applications, some few applications from many that have been out there with uh, using these models. What I would like to basically focus on is the different geographical levels that these models have been used on. They have been used on a global level, national, or a local level, talking about city level. So, what is the need for energy system modeling? David was talking about the complexity of energy systems and how we actually need to incorporate a lot of parameters. We're talking about primary energy sources, risks, we're talking about effects on the economy, environmental protection, and then on top of all this, we're talking about a low carbon energy system. So, the interactions of all these different parameters uh, have to be included in an energy systems approach. So we need to see the whole of the energy system. We, don't, we cannot basically deal with all these points by looking at certain parts of the energy system. So, uh, well, I don't really see this, but the idea is that you need to have the primary energy, so the resources, and then all the transformation going down to the final energy, and then all the different uh, consumption sectors, and there we have flows of energy and prices and uh, in investment costs, and then we have the flows of uh, emissions as well. So all these can, should be included in an overall energy systems model. The idea is that you have the reality, and then you try to represent the reality within a model. You turn this into a mathematical description, you fill in the data that you have, you optimize, and you have the model results. But then, it's basically this part, the feedback, which is important. Because whatever comes out of the model is not necessarily the, so the, you know, the, the answer, the solution to all your problems. It's not that you press the button and then everything is solved. You basically need to sit down and discuss and see, so what comes out? Why do these results come out? Do they depend on the input that I put in there or the mathematical description that I've used? Or is it actually something important that I should, should take into account? And then all this feedback should go in the loop and until you reach a point where you have meaningful results that you can actually use in policy making. So this is not new. It all started back in 1976 for ETSA after the first oil crisis. Back then they were talking about alternatives to oil and needs for research and development for new technologies and so on. So the Energy Technology Systems Analysis Program was created as an implementing agreement or a technology collaboration program of the IEA, the International Energy Agency. At the moment, we have contracting parties that uh, cover 20 countries, the European Commission, and what's interesting is basically that the last years we also have private companies that are doing research, because as private big companies, they want to see alternative futures for the energy sector in which they're actually dealing. And, uh, they try to use models like this in their analysis. Um, apart from the contracting parties, you can see that quite a lot of other countries are basically using the model. There are users within these countries that are actually using the model and they're trying to run scenarios and um, there is this unique framework of energy modeling teams that are using Markal, which was the previous model, and basically Times, which is now the new model that ETSAP has developed. So, what is Times? It's a linear programming, so it's optimization. It's what we call bottom-up, so it has a very detailed technology representation. It's an integrated model of the, for the entire energy system. It's usually used for medium to long-term prospective analysis. So we're talking about horizons that go up to 20, 50 years, or even 100 years in some runs from now. It is demand-driven in the sense that we need to put into the model the development for the need of, of energy, so or for the need of use for the energy. So we need to put in there GDP or population development and so on, and make basically assumptions about how these parameters will affect the demand for heating and cooling and lighting and so on. Uh, it's a partially equilibrium model because it looks only into the uh, energy market. It's dynamic because it moves through the years and it's basically giving you the equilibrium of all these years. It does the optimal technology solution since we have a least cost solution overall. You include all types of constraints, so environmental constraints are included. And uh, you can also do things like uh, 
emission permits or energy training, uh, trading and emission permit trading within regions that we have in the model. Uh, demands can be price elastic, so there is a response to the increase of the price of the commodity uh, to its consumption, so um, this can be included as well. Uh, there are basically two, two interfaces in the model, it's called data front end and back end, that is being used for in data input and then analysis of the results. Uh, if you are interested, we have uh, this book was published sort of two years ago, and um, then NetSup members have uh, tried to collate the uh, work that has been done using the Times model. So it's, uh, I think it's available. And currently, we're also working to publish a new book, which is basically focusing to the well below two degrees well that we, all, all the other speakers have also been talking about after the Paris Agreement. So why? How can we basically use these models to do global scenarios of that? According to the uh, IS physics analysis, there is a very interesting trend in the global CO2 emissions that has appeared over the last three years. For the first time, global emissions are constant, but global economy is growing. Is this the point? Is it the turning point or not? I don't know, but at least it's an indication that this is a new trend. It's the first time in history that we can see that. So, this is something good to, to basically follow and see what is going on. Now, regarding technologies, because all this is basically based on technologies, the IA has done an analysis, and according to it, some of them are on track regarding the possible development, but some of them read accelerated improvement, and some of them are quite not on track. These things like CCS, for instance, is quite back in this story and transfer fire fuels, whereas solar PV and onshore wind are doing quite well. And then there are some other renewables that are still need to have accelerated improvement. So basically, we need to analyze in more detail these technologies and see how they can, um, uh, their uh, use can be improved in the future. And uh, ETAP, using TIMES, has developed what we call etap -TM, the TIMES Integrated Assessment Model. This is a global model which is uh, done using the Times uh, model generator. It basically separates the work in 15 regions uh, and uh, it also has an, uh, a climate module. So you can basically see the effect of the energy system on the total climate, on the global climate, and you can see the effect on the temperature rise. So you can use basically that to add uh, constraints regarding the temperature rise that comes out from the probable developments of your energy system. Um, so, well, this is what the web looks like according to ETSAP TM. You basically have the total energy system coming from uh, fossil fuels and, and then renewables and then um, the, um, all the other uh, demand sectors and so on. You also have a climate module on one side and you have the non-energy sectors which are the CHPs and so on, on the other, on, sorry, the CH4s. Uh, on, on, on the other side, so we try to include all the possible uh, sources that are basically affecting the climate, and then the climate model is done is doing some basic uh, calculations to see the temperature change that come out of these emissions. Uh, so, some work, lots of work, lots of work has been published using SFTM. This is just one example, for instance, that uh, has been done lately in order to see how low can we go, so how far below these two degrees can we achieve the temperature stabilization? So this is the temperature increase here. This is the reference scenario that would go up to plus six degrees. And then uh, trying to see how can the temperature basically change over the years until 2100. According to this one, at least, you can see that staying below the 1.5 degrees over the whole time horizon seems to be quite difficult. There seems to be a trend to overshoot and then go down after 1.5 degrees. So, I don't know if this is true or not, or nobody knows basically, but it's an indication, it says something, it says that maybe we're already too late, so we have to start working now, because otherwise we won't have the time. It seems that temperature increase will overshoot anyway, but at least we should start as soon as possible in order to make sure that then it goes down again. Um, is this the PDF or the PPT? Is this the PDF or the PPT? PP. Sure. Yes. It's not a PDF, but anyway. 
So anyway, these are the results regarding the emissions from this scenario run, and um, this is uh, broken down by regions, because I've told you this is a global model with uh, uh, all the regions. So you can see what happens to the reference scenario. But then if we're talking about the low decarbonization scenarios, the below 1.5 degree scenarios, you see that we're talking about negative emissions after 20, um, 2070, 2080 over there, and more and more degrees. So in order to achieve that decrease back to 1.5 degrees, we're talking about an energy system that has negative emissions. And then if we talk about the primary energy, we see that basically um, uh, renewable energy is playing a large role in all those scenarios compared to the reference scenario. And if we look into the final energy, the tendency in all these scenarios is electrification. It has been mentioned before as well, basically, that there seems to be a, a tendency of renewables for electricity generation, electrification, and the final demand. So, um, based on the Times model, uh, the IA is also done, is, uh, is also developed in using this ETB uh, model, the, the Energy Technology Perspectives model. Somebody talked about it yesterday, basically. And the IA is using this model to do their, um, uh, and the, uh, the ETP, the Energy Technology Perspectives Handler. Uh, the way they have used it is that they have a times model on the supply side, and then they have the simulations models on the demand side. So basically, they calculate here the needed uh, demands for the different uh, energy commodities, and then they have an optimization times model to satisfy this demand. And they're using this to, to run global scenarios. And uh, the latest runs that have been done after the, uh, the Paris Agreement is basically going below the two degrees. Until now, the two degree scenario, so basically an increase of two degrees by 2100, was the, 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 the lowest scenario. Now they have actually started running the beyond two degree scenario, which means an extra reduction of CO2 emissions, and which means that we have an CO2 neutral and a global energy system by 2060 in this scenario. And what is the extra contribution that is needed there? You see that energy efficiency was playing the most important role, but now it is playing an even more important role. So it has to, you have to do even more regarding energy efficiency in order to go to these uh, low emissions. Renewables have to be increased a lot, uh, and then nuclear still plays a role, but quite small. But then we're talking about CCS. So once you start talking about negative emissions, so very low emissions, CCS is very important. And you remember CCS was on one of the technologies that was really off track. So it comes in our scenarios, it comes in our analysis, but technology-wise, we're still really behind. So if we really believe that this can be used, technology should be improved. Um, the other thing that we're talking about is storage. Because once you have more and more um, viable electricity generation from renewables, storage is important. So batteries and development of batteries. And what came out from ETP is basically that um, electric vehicles and, uh, can play a very huge role. Because we're talking about vehicles that you plug them during the night. They can be used as a storage of the road for the system. So they can store when they are not charging. So it, they can really play an important role regarding the balancing of the overall system. And the assumption there is that, um, or is that, no, I think it's more of an output, is basically that the price of the, or the battery costs in the joint TDS scenario will decrease quite rapidly compared to that. And this is probably consistent with the fact that um, um, electric vehicle manufacturers are expecting really a boom for electric vehicles to come in. So there seems to be a tendency of reduction of prices which basically will affect overall uh, the costs of electric vehicles. And then, as I said before, CCS. It seems that the beyond two degrees, the CCS, CCS will become one of, well, very, very important regarding the achievement of the reduction of this CO2. And you can see that basically, apart from China, uh, and uh, well, the US is there, it's basically the rest of the world that we have to contribute more in CCS in this beyond two, two degree scenario. Okay, so it's, it's not uh, China or the US anymore, it, uh, and India is basically the rest of the world where this technology should be installed. So um, that was on the global level. Now a lot of runs have been done regarding on, on the national levels, and uh, some of the analysis that we present here are basically done by partners of ESA. 
So in, in Portugal, we talked about this trend for um, electrification and high energy demand. So they had this specific uh, project, project to see how that the electrification can contribute to the deep decarbonization of the Portuguese system. So um, they have, um, these are the obligations according to the law at the moment. And then they have run some scenarios within the lower decreases. So the, the one with the lowest is basically 85 degrees the percent reduction of CO2 emissions compared to the level of uh, 20, uh, 2010. So this is a very, very you know, big, big reduction in CO2 emissions. And what they see is basically that the share of the electricity in the final energy consumption is not really affected too much in 2030 in all these scenarios. But by 2050, you can see that electrification is basically increasing with the, inc with the decrease of your CO2 emissions. So when you, in the long term, when you try to uh, reduce more and more the CO, the CO2 emissions, in this case, the electrification is becoming uh, higher and higher, and it reaches almost 50% of the final energy consumption uh, in, in, um, uh, in 2050, in this case, of the 85% reduction of emissions. Uh, well, th th this shows basically which uh, sectors are be uh, basically being affected, and it seems that the first one is the transport sectors, which has the highest increase in electricity. So what we're talking about about electric vehicles, and then uh, the other sectors are basically following in the high decarbonization scenarios. Um, and then the effect on the power mix is basically that the renewables are increasing and increasing. And we're talking about 75 renewable electricity in 2030, and maybe almost 98 percent, or almost 100 percent, basically renewable electricity by uh, 2025 in this case. Well, the Portuguese, they have a lot of hydro and they have wind and PV, so they have the potential basically to, to do that. And it seems like they have to exploit it overall in order to achieve these targets that they have there. Um, well, this is a bit complicated, but anyway, these are scenarios that have been run for, for Ireland. They, they're using the Irish Times and they're also using micro. Micro is a simplified macroeconomic model that is coupled with, with time. So you can basically see the effect of the development of the energy system on the GDP of the country. So you can see the overall macroeconomic effect. So they've run a lot of different scenarios as well regarding the reduction of the CO2 emissions and so on. But what's interesting here is that they've also calculated marginal abatement costs. So a carbon fee, how much would it would cost to reduce the extra ton of CO2 in here. So you can see that uh, when we're talking about very high decarbonization scenarios, they came up with quite huge numbers regarding this cost. So it makes sense if we're talking about this huge reduction of 85% of CO2 emissions overall. But the interesting thing is that when you look at the GDP impact, you see that you can still have economic growth which does not differ too much from the reference. The reference is the red one. So this is the, well, this is the crisis. And then this is Ireland recovering, basically. But the, the reference, which is the red one, you can see that more or less you tend to have the same, well, very small differences regarding the, the economic growth, even in the case where you're talking about deep decarbonization scenario. So the, the, this is one of the main, um, uh, outcomes here is that you can basically have a decarbonized system without significant GDP impact. Um, the Nordic countries, so um, Sweden, Norway, Finland, and uh, Denmark, they have done some exercises as well in this energy technology uh, perspectives of 2016, trying to see again a deep decarbonization of their systems until 2050, basically reaching um, um, a reduction of almost 90% compared to 2015 in their energy systems. Now, the, the interesting thing is that in the Nordic countries, uh, emissions and GDP are already The, uh, yeah, uh, basically you can see that GDP is growing, but the emissions are being reduced. They're decoupled. So they're already decoupled since 2005, basically. And they just want to reduce this trend more and more. And uh, what you see here is in their analysis, basically buildings and the power sector that can become uh, CO2 neutral by 2050. 
transport and industry still emits a bit. And you can, you can realize that because that's a difficult base to try to, to come up with. So in the case of the electricity generation, you can see that uh, they have lots of wind and hydro and geothermal and biomass and nuclear. So foresight can basically disappear by 2050. And district heating, because they have, well, it's cold up there, so they need a lot of district heating. So you can see electricity is coming up and taking part of district heating. They have geothermal and biomass and then basically natural gas, which is again more or less disappeared by 2050. So the whole of the power and heat generation system turns to uh, almost um, completely renewable, or let's say CO2 free, because they have a bit of nuclear as well, by 2050. <coughs> the other interesting thing is actually what happens with transport. And here they see a complete decoupling between the demand for transport and the actual emission from the transport sector. And well, the transport sector, the transport sector is one of the largest emission, emitters of the road, so this is quite important. And how they do that, you can see here the change in the stock. So we're talking about fuel cells, electric cars, plug-in hybrids, hybrids uh, that basically cover almost the largest part of the, the fleet, and then there's just a small part there which is left for, for internal combustion engines. But then even these, they use blend of biofuels. So you can see here the introduction of biofuels into their systems. So they still have a small part of their fleet which is internal combustion, but it basically uh, operates with a, with a large part which is biofuel. Uh, the interesting thing you get here is uh, if you try to do an analysis of the costs. And they came up basically that they need higher investments in buildings, <laughs> but uh, uh, in the power you actually have less investments in a decarbonized system. So they came up that they say that basically in this uh, very low um, emission scenario, uh, they need to pay only 10% more. The total cost of their system in order to reach this almost zero CO2 emission scenario is just 10% more, okay? So it, may, it makes sense. Now, that's overall regarding countries. Let's have a look what happens at, at the level of cities. Now, the IEA has done some scenarios last year, and they were focusing on in cities. And the important message is that by 2050, two-thirds of the world population will live in urban areas. The tendency globally is that the size of the population that lives in urban areas is increasing. And there is even more so in countries like China, and in India, uh, and in Africa, <coughs> so the developing world. Uh, in OECD, there's already a very high share, and there's tendency to increase. So more and more people will live in cities, more and more emissions will come from cities. So doing an analysis, they also came up with the fact that cities may represent, by 2050, 70% of the cost-effective CO2 abatement. So most of the, well, most of the cost-effective CO2 should come from actions that are focusing on the cities. And this effect is indirect in power and heat. So basically, a reduction of the demand in electricity and heating in, city, in, in the cities would basically uh, have as a consequence the reduction of emissions from power and heat generation. So you can see that almost 70% of the um, reduction will come from the urban areas, and only the remaining 30% will come from the non-urban areas in order to reach this level of emissions by um, uh, 2050 in the two-year scenario. Having this in mind, there, were, there are some analyses that have been done using times. And this is an example of analysis that has been done in Oslo within this uh, Nordic Energy Technology Perspective Analysis. Um, and um, uh, well, basically these are results that show that again, in, at the city level, the aim is basically to just try to minimize the overall emission. And they end up with just a small part of emissions that they had initially that is basically coming from transport and district heating. So <coughs> sectors that are difficult to be decarbonized. Um, and um, the other thing that I would like to talk to you about is this uh, method that we have used in, in a project that has been included lately, which is in SMART. And we've tried to integrate an energy systems model here in the city planning format platform in an overall analysis of uh, the energy system of a city. So the idea is that first of all, we need to represent the existing situation. So we've done door-to-door -door surveys for the building energy consumption and the stock, the, building, the existing building stock. 
We've done door-to-door -door surveys for the transport and mobility analysis to see what is the transport need in the cities. All these came into a, a, an overall a Times model for the city, which basically did the analysis of the, on the different scenarios. And then we have included an uh, MCDA, Market Criteria Decision Analysis System, taking all the decision makers at the level of the city into account. So we came up with a compromised solution with the MCDA with all the different stakeholders. Uh, this is what the, well, the details of the uh, times model. So we have all the analysis of the different flows and so on. And uh, then the different um, uh, options that have been included in order to have a sustainable energy future for 2030 in this city. So if you're interested, you can have a look at the website over there. So um, closing. It seems that an integrated system approach is something that we need because we have a lot of different technology options from the supply, from the demand, from the transformation. So we need to use an energy system, an overall integrated approach in order to achieve our targets, but also we need to use an integrated energy system to do the analysis. Um, a mix of technologies are needed, and although the Paris Agreement was historic, we now need to make actions basically to reach these targets. Um, New technologies that are currently in the innovation development phase need to be supported strongly to come in. And the last part is basically that cities, they can lead this low carbon transition. And at the same time, we can have uh, improved of air quality within the city. So it's basically a double thing that it's not only the global low carbon transition, but also locally we have improved air quality in the cities. So. Um, that's all, thank you. And uh, if you need more information, you can go to the website over there.